this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. Hey, before we get into today's episode, I want to take a second and describe a new project I've been working on for the last year or so. It's a book called The Art of Selling Your Business, Winning Strategies and Secret Hacks for Exiting on Top. And it's coming out on January 12th, 2021. So what I've done is distilled down some of the best practices, kind of hacks and ideas and strategies of all the episodes we've done here at Built to Sell Radio. There's more than almost more than 250 of them now. And what I try to do is codify the best ideas into this book. It's divided into three sections, everything you need to do before you get started, how do you drum up multiple offers for your company, and then finally, how do you punch above your weight class in a negotiation to sell. To get a copy, just go to builttosell.com slash selling. Here's the next episode. So I really enjoyed this interview, and truth be told, I wasn't expecting to. It's with a guy named Todd Kaufman, who is a really smart guy, and that's not why I was not expecting to enjoy it. It was because we were going to talk about ESOPs. Now, that's a term that you may have heard before, but my own impression of an ESOP was kind of a convoluted mess, quite frankly, a way to sell your business over time that took forever and had all sorts of downsides to it. Well, Kaufman really disabused me of that fact. He went in to describe many pros to using an ESOP as a way to sell your company and and also some of the downsides as well in candor and great detail. And so if you've ever thought about this as a potential exit option, selling your business effectively to your employees, here to tell you the way he did it is Todd Kaufman. Todd Kaufman, welcome to Build to Sell Radio. Thanks, thank you for having me. It's great to uh, to be chatting with you. I should put my headphones on. That's a bad. That's my bad. I forgot to do that. But while I do that, you could t- can you tell us a little bit about Test Double? I love the name, by the way. But for folks who don't know you guys, what what is it that you do? Yeah, we uh, do custom software development for our clients. So sometimes that takes the form of a smaller business who maybe doesn't have a full time development staff and they need something built. Uh, we're happy to, you know, work with them to to make sure that uh, software is is constructed kind of to spec under budget uh, and within their their time constraints. In other cases, we help a lot of bigger businesses scale. So maybe they're running into challenges with, hey, we we're struggling to get over the hump with our Series C round to meet all of the needs of the new users that we have coming on. Uh, we can help them kind of overcome those obstacles. So really. Anything with custom software, we're eager to help out. Got it. And so, how? What's your billing model? Are you kind of time and materials? Are you project based? What's how do you charge customers? We've done both. Uh, we try to be easy to work with, and usually that winds up with uh, open ended time and materials contracts. So, uh, we we find it's a good level of uh, healthy pressure for us to deliver if we know that at any point you can just say, "Hey, uh, we're done here." Um, and that also means that companies don't have to necessarily book us for six months or nine months or 12 months. They can start working with us and, you know, just with a week's notice, uh, let us go. Got it. And so the, the people that you have, everyone from software engineers to user experience people, I'm assuming they all have kind of different hourly rates and that you bill out based on. Yeah, we, yeah. we do have different rates. Uh, it depends a lot on kind of the needs, some of the harder problems of, hey, how do we get this system that's been built by 50 engineers to scale so that it can meet the needs of 100,000 users? That's probably a different capability and skill set than someone who has, hey, I have $50,000, I need a uh, mobile app built. Um, so we'll, we'll charge accordingly. Uh, but typically our, our consultants have you know, 10 plus years of experience. So they tend to be more of a, a kind of a premium offering. What's your approach to recruiting employees? Because I'd imagine... Uh, software engineers, software developers, designers. I mean, these, these guys are in hot, hot demand. What's what's your approach to recruiting? 
Yeah. So in the past, what we've done is try to meet them where they are. So we do a lot of conference presentations. My co-founder, Justin Searles, uh, he's really made a name for himself in a lot of the tech communities just by sharing valuable insights and, you know, what we've learned along the way in our careers. Um, and that's a great natural draw to bring candidates in. So uh, conferences, this year, yeah, big live conferences where tech yep. uh, guys and gals meet and, and he'll do a presentation. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it, it garners interest. I think we're both uh, pretty open uh, about what it's like to work at Test Double and what our clients uh, are bringing to us as far as like challenging projects. And What's the pitch sound like? I mean, let's, let's say I'm a Google, I'm a, I've got an offer from Google and I've got an offer from Test Double. Uh, wh- like, how would Justin convince me to come to Test Double and not take the, the fat check from Google? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's, a, that's definitely a tough pitch because uh, the Googles and Facebooks of the world uh, definitely throw a lot of money around. So uh, with Testable, what you get is a level of autonomy uh, and a level of work-life balance that probably doesn't exist at the Googles and Facebooks of the world. Um, I used to take it as an insult when people called us a lifestyle business, but now I I wear it more as a a badge of honor. Um, We want our people to be able to go to their kids' soccer games and and baseball games and things like that. Um, So, I think that level of autonomy and balance is key. Uh, we're also uh, just a company that is a, a good accelerant for growth. So we have uh, a lot of really talented people here. So there's always someone that you can learn from. And consulting is interesting because it provides a, a nice variety of life. So you get to see a lot of different problems uh, with different customers across industries. And you start to see those patterns and, and what you can do to, to fix those issues. Uh, so it just tends to help you level up in your career, I think, a little bit faster than working for, say, a product company. I'd love to explore a little bit around this whole lifestyle business thing. What was it in the past that irked you about being labeled that way? Yeah, I think in the context, it was definitely more of a pejorative. Uh, so we were actually approached about acquisition from a customer uh, early on, and they were you know, describe, I think what they were trying to say was that, hey, we could have a much bigger impact if we kind of worked in this product that was a VC backed, you know, high growth startup. And um, they kind of termed it as, you know, or you could continue just doing this lifestyle business that you're doing. And uh, that was definitely, uh, it felt like a punch below the belt a little bit. Um, But I was communicating with, uh, you know, another co-founder and CEO uh, who runs a similar business. And he's like, you are a lifestyle business. He's like, you should embrace it. Uh, the fact that, you know, you're not having to work 65 hour weeks to build something. The fact that you're not having to fly all over the country chasing private equity and things like that. Like, enjoy the fact that we have a steady growth, highly profitable uh, business where people can work 40 hours a week and then go spend the rest of their time with their families. Talk about the growth rate and the profitability, if you don't mind, to the extent that you can share how, how fast do you typically grow year over year and what are sort of the margins you're working with? Can you share any of that, uh, any of that data? Sure. Uh, so we are, from a growth rate perspective, we've probably gone up about 25 to 50% year over year um, wow. as far as size goes. Uh, so that's been steady growth for us, which is good. Um, it doesn't feel like we've ever outgrown our ability to support our, our employees, uh, which is good. There's been times where maybe we've strained that a little bit, but we've tried to always, you know, bring on people, bring on clients uh, at a steady pace so that we can make sure we're always delivering a, an exceptional level of service. Um, from a profitability perspective, we're targeting typically 20 to 25% net profit. Um, anytime it's outside of those, we want to understand why and we want to uh, see what we can do. Typically, if it's, you know, a higher profit margin, that means we're trying to figure out ways to, to get that back to employees, either via a level of service and support internally or via you know, higher salaries, et cetera. Uh, if it's Got below it. that, then we, we have to look at you know, what's going on. Uh, this year, it dipped below that, um, but a lot of that was rate pressure and things like that uh, from, from COVID. Got it. So, so if I heard you right, when you go north of 25%, you guys don't all celebrate and crack a bottle of champagne. You, that's a warning <laughs> sign for you. Exactly. I, that probably means that the business is um, maybe undervaluing employees and, and we want to make sure to turn that around. Uh, so uh, that can pretty quickly lead to you know attrition and that can lead to a lower level of service for our clients. 
So that when that number is north of 25%, it can turn around really quickly if uh, you're not making sure to reward your employees who are doing all the hard work. Got it. And and I know you've done a lot of work around around valuing the business, but as you started to think about your next steps as a company, uh, how were you thinking about the value of the business? Did you have any sort of benchmarks? Did you have a valuation done? What, what was your uh, technique there? Yeah, we actually were approached. So we knew kind of towards the end of 2018, it started feeling like any exit for myself or my co-founder would take time uh, or it would be really jarring to the business, right? Like uh, acquisition or merger or something like that. So we felt like we wanted to at least start planning for this, knowing that neither one of us was going anywhere for the next five or 10 years. Um, to that end, we actually were approached about a couple of different uh, M&A opportunities. So we found a, a local consultant who actually specializes in M&A activity. And one of the things mm -hmm. that he does is a discounted cash flow evaluation. So he was able to provide us some, some sense of, hey, here's what the business is worth. Um, at a, at a pretty reasonable rate. Uh, and then he was also able to apply that to some of the other M&A opportunities that we could you know, evaluate. Hey, is this a good deal or is this something that we should pass on? Can you provide a definition for discounted cash flow cal uh, valuation, what, what that entails? Uh, for us, it was a lot of past financials. And uh, what he was using then was you know, kind of the, the level of cash that we're generating um, consistently and the level of growth that we're experiencing, uh, what would that look like as an investment opportunity compared to other alternatives? Uh, there were some discounts also made for marketability. Uh, we're, we're not necessarily a huge business. We're not necessarily, um, you know, a product business where it's easy to kind of put a, a value on the assets uh, or a services business, like other than like 50 or so laptops, we don't have a lot of assets, right? <laughs> right. Um, so that, that was what he was using to, to provide that valuation. And sort of what multiple of your profit did that DCF render? Like if, if you ran all the numbers, did you get a, a multiple of, of pre-tax profit that he felt was kind of reasonable? Yeah, he, he basically felt like it was a range. And I think that's accurate. So, and it depends on the buyer. Uh, you can probably get a higher multiple if you're going a PE route. Uh, you can probably get a much lower multiple if you're going merger or acquisition with a comparable company. Uh, or even in our industry, a lot of times you'll see an aqua hire where people are, you know, just buying you for the headcounts that software developers are in need. As you mentioned earlier, they look mm -hmm. at testable and they're like, hey, that's a 50 person hiring event if we could pull it off. But that's also probably the lowest multiple that we would receive. So in the middle, it was somewhere around six and a half percent of EBITDA. Six, or six, and six and a half times. times EBITDA, yeah, sorry. Got it. Got it. Got it. So six and a half times EBITDA was sort of where he thought it might land. Exactly. Okay. And and so let's get into the the sale itself. So you mentioned you're roughly 50 people. Yes. Yeah. And I'd love to explore a little bit around the what triggered you guys to get on the front foot because it sounds like you'd sort of had a few very somewhat superficial conversations, but then what changed? What made you go from uh, maybe one day, you know, we're four or five years away to getting on your front foot and, and, and really starting to, to put some heavy work into it. Yeah, I think that um, really just being inundated with the different options that were out there, it felt like it was something that we needed to research and put a little bit more time into. So mm -hmm. 2019, this was largely the main strategic project I worked on was to figure mm -hmm. out, okay, what are we going to do? Um, and I think the impetus for that was was a couple of reasons. One, we really strongly feel like our purpose, our mission as a business is never going to be done. Uh, our mission is to improve the way the world builds software because the industry is still broken in a lot of ways. And that's, that's not going to, it's like an asymptote, right? Like you're never going to actually be done with that mission. So we felt like, okay, the business should be sustainable uh, in the long term, And that means it will outlive myself and my co-founder if we do it right. The second piece was, we had started to see, you know, the outsized contributions that he and I made in the early going were now dwarfed by 50 team members who were all delighting our clients on a daily basis, who were all, you know, recruiting other people in to, to help delight our clients and, and really carrying the, the weight of the organization more on their shoulders and less on ours. 
So we felt there was an equitability standpoint that, that needed to be addressed. We knew we wanted to get shares into our employees' hands. Uh, we were just maybe a little bit confused about how to do that. I want to push back a little bit on that and, and not in a, in a, in a, argumentative way, but I think there's a lot of people listening would be like, okay, Todd, like, hold on a second. You guys put in all the sweat equity and, 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 and that's the way capitalism works. Damn it. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> if you take the risk, you get the reward and, and all this equitable stuff is, you know, like that's for people in Portland to worry about. This is, this is capitalism. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> there's people, I mean, I, rebut that, that, that sort of way it, of thinking. It's, it, it's honestly something that we went back and forth on a number of times throughout the years. And, you know, a lot of our peers would refer to it as owner's guilt and kind of dismiss it that way. Right. Like, Oh, you're just suffering from a bout of owner's guilt. <laughs> like, yeah, I've been suffering from it for like two years now. <laughs> like when does this go away? Um, with us, I think it's, it's different for, for different types of businesses, first of all. So some businesses are more inherently risky. Some businesses are more of, hey, somebody maybe cultivated an idea over a period of years and really kind of built the foundation or the core of that and, and, and were able to, should be compensated disproportionately for that. I think with us, if we felt the transition from, hey, we, we took a lot of risk, no doubt about it. We've worked a lot of hours, put a lot of time and energy into this business. And we felt like it should be rewarded for that, no doubt. We just felt like that payoff has a time frame. Uh, at some point, when you see a lot of others who are really advancing the business forward, closing new deals, referring in new clients, and then delighting those clients, you have to take a pretty hard look to say, okay, what is my involvement here? Have I been fairly compensated for my involvement over the past nine years in our case? And, and we felt like that was the case. We felt like, okay, at this point, you know, the first nine years, great. Uh, we, we appreciate um, the compensation that we've received for that effort. Now, we want to see our employees get rewarded for that same amount. And that brings us to how you chose to sell the company, where I want to go there next. Before, though, we do, how much... I mean, I'm assuming because it was a, it was not a very capital-intensive business in your own admission, a bunch of laptops is all we kind of need. Uh, are you and, and Justin, Justin is the co-founder, right? Correct. Yeah. So I'm just doing the math and 50 people and I'm, you know, 20% profit. Like there's a lot of cash that is sort of the, the business is generating. Are you guys able to, to pull that out in the way of dividends or, or, or salary along the nine year run, or are you having to reinvest that along the way? A combination of both. Uh, so Typically, the company profits, we were able to um, just pull out. Uh, we were a LLC taxed as an S-Corp uh, in the U.S. So basically, we were receiving profits, you know, kind of throughout the years um, as owners draws. Um, some portion of that uh, goes to pay tax on all of that stuff. And then the rest mm -hmm. uh, we were able to keep. So there was a, a decent portion that just went to us as income. And we paid ourselves fair salaries for the roles that we were playing. But it became disproportionate that the profits the business was making was much more a part of our income. Um, there were also times where, where you do need to invest still as a services company. Mm -hmm. um, we've been remote even before COVID. Uh, so we've been remote the entire nine years. So we don't have that big office space or anything like that, that we've needed to invest in. Uh, but sometimes you don't realize the supporting roles that you need until you're kind of stuck in it. And then you take a dip in, in profitability so that you can get, really talented engineering management in place so that you can get a professional level of HR in place so that you can hire a salesperson or a, or a recruiter uh, or an account manager or something like that. So we've made those hires strategically throughout and you would see kind of dips in profitability along that way. But those investments by and large have all paid off by helping us scale and, and furthering our growth. Got it. So you guys pull up and say, you know, we've been fairly compensated over the last nine years. And for the next tranche of our growth for the next stage of our growth. We want other people to participate in that. Yep. Uh, and, and so I guess one option is to sell the company, although that gives a huge windfall to you and encouraging the new buyers to incentivize or make shareholders of, of your employees. Uh, I mean, did you guys think about that? Like, what were the options on the table? You mentioned 2019, this was your major project. So what, what options did you consider? 
Yeah, I think that we made the Inc. 5000 like five years in a row, which means on average, I thank you. Uh, on average, we get about two email per week of PE or VC funds reaching out to see if they're right. if we're interested. Working right? from the same um, list. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Looking down. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, so, so those are always flattering, of course. So we we did take a look at that, and that would have been a higher outcome for for Justin and myself. Uh, what we felt it lacked was that path for sustainability, because um, one, you're kind of conceding your culture at that point. Uh, you're letting PE and or a VC firm kind of own what is the focus. And I think in 2020, had we done that, the focus would have been on slashing, you know, uh, expenses uh, whenever we started to see some bench. So I think it would have hurt our culture and it definitely would have transferred equity into our employees. We also looked at, you know, uh, merger and acquisition options. Those can be risky. If you can find a similar company, I think that aligns with your purpose. And if the sum is greater than the parts and the finances work out, like you have to have all of those things, then it can be a good outcome. And we just didn't see one of those materialize. Um, beyond that, we were looking at other ways just to get, maybe we could sell shares to our employees. Uh, that was an option. Uh, the problem with that is it puts more of an onus on the employee to have some level of liquidity um, or access to cash or access to credit. And we felt like that wasn't equitable. Uh, we didn't want somebody who maybe didn't have great credit, who maybe you know um, didn't have a lot of access to cash, who was a great member of our team and delighting our clients. We didn't want them to be left out or disproportionately uh, affected with this transaction. So the ESOP was really the only one that we felt kind of scratched the, the itch of, Justin and I get fairly compensated. Uh, the business's culture uh, and you know kind of purpose uh, would remain intact and the employees would be equitably rewarded with ownership. Okay, and, and that's the avenue you chose to go down is sell it, uh, sell it via an ESOP. It's the first time in something like 300 episodes, as I was mentioning to you before we hit record, that we've ever talked about an ESOP. So this is exciting for me because I know nothing about ESOPs. So you're gonna be my <laughs> education here. I've heard the term, uh, I know Jack Stack does something that's all very, you know, it's all very, hazy for me. So sure. first of all, decode the acronym. What does the word ESOP stand for? What are the letters ESOP stand for? Yeah. So ESOP is an employee stock ownership program. And uh, this was uh, came out of the same ERISA um, legislation, I think in the 70s, uh, to, to allow and encourage uh, companies to transfer ownership to a broader base of the employees. So that's it at a high level. Uh, we can dive into more details. I think that's yeah. yeah, the important parts to understand are basically a trust is formed and the trust is responsible for managing allocation and compensation of shares of the ESOP over a period of time. Uh, so what basically happens is as people um, work at Test Double, there are allocation events that happen on an annual basis. Assuming you're eligible, you get some portion of shares. Uh, and it's basically the company is transferring its shares from it to this ESOP trust, and then the ESOP trust is assigning those to people. And it has to be done on uh, in a fair way. For us, that's based on compensation. So the shares are split based on compensation throughout the year. So people um, who earn more get more uh, shares in the ESOP. Exactly. Higher paying, higher paid people. Exactly. And so, so you and Justin effectively sell your shares in the company to this trust. Is I, that I would right? think of, I would think of it this way. The company buys itself from Justin and I. The company then enters into an agreement to gradually transfer ownership of itself to the ESOP. And that tends to happen over a long period of time. For us, it's 35 years because you don't want to, you know, be 10 years down the line still growing, still hiring people and have no shares to like allocate to people. So over a longer period of time, like 35 years, that means people are starting to retire as those people are retiring or just resigning or, or being terminated, whatever the case may be, those shares are coming back into the pool that can then be dispersed in the next wave of employees. So it's kind of a, a perpetual motion machine of allocation of shares if you do it right. Okay. So the part I'm digging in or trying to understand is, so you and Justin own 100% of Test Double before this transaction, as I understand. Correct. Is that right? Correct. 
So you then effectively sell those shares because you're individuals, like Todd's a guy, Justin's a guy. So you sell those shares to an entity called your company, effectively. Right. So the company basically enters into an agreement with us uh, for evaluation. Now, there's a lot of structure around this. So a valuation firm is, is another entity that was part of this transaction, and they'll be a part of every year providing evaluation of what test doubles were. So they take into account everything. They come back and say, okay, here's what test doubles were. That affects share price and everything like that. For this first event, it meant that that kind of was negotiated, but that was what uh, test double was worth. So that's the amount that the company is going to pay Justin and I. We did that in a mixture of seller and bank financed. So uh, we were able to take some money off the table uh, via bank loans. Those bank loans also funded all of the expense of the ESOP. Uh, so that didn't have to necessarily hit the company immediately in one month. Then we have uh, seller-based financing for largely like 80% of the value of the company that um, the company will just continue to pay off throughout the years. So you are effectively financing the sale of the business. So you're- Exactly. Okay. And, and with regards to the bank loans, you mentioned 20%. Um, were, so the bank was willing to, to, to essentially- loan your company that money, did you have to sign a personal guarantee for that bank loan or? We did not. And you have to okay. find the right bank to make this happen. So uh, first of all, we used a, a capital firm to help us negotiate all of this. So Lazier Capital is who we used. Uh, they're very familiar with ESOP. They probably do 25 ESOP transactions a year. They have a lot of banking relationships. They know a lot of trustees. They know a lot of valuation firms. So like Paying for them to have all these connections was pretty instrumental to our success. Mm -hmm. um, finding a bank that invests in a company that has good profit margins, but zero assets is non-trivial. So uh, they found one that was extremely savvy and understood ESOPs very well, understood what they meant and how high the likelihood of repayment was. Um, and that was fifth third in our case, they were able to, um, you know, give us a loan for, I think it was uh, 4.75 million um, that was basically unsecured by assets uh, other than just, you know, the company entity itself. Um, so that required a, a lot of due diligence, but that, again, that's been a, a great relationship and it's been odd. I think the, the healthy pressure of knowing that you have some, some outstanding debt, some sizable outstanding debt makes you focus on, on really running the business in an efficient way. And and so I'm assuming that the way Fifth Third structured it is they are first in line in the event of some sort of default by the company that they would get paid back first. Is that right? Exactly. Their primary and justify seller's notes or subordinate. Okay. Got it. So if I'm doing the math right, they they loaned you four and a half million dollars, which is equates to 20% of the overall value. Is that right? So exactly. So our valuation was at 23 million. Got it. Got it. And that was a uh, higher multiple than what I had described before, because we were doing as a company somewhere around three and a half to four million than EBITDA uh, prior to this. Got it. So th yeah, so three and a half times six and a half is around twenty. Is that right? I'm, I'm yeah. Just so doing there, were, it was a little bit uptick there. And it. The good thing was, um, again, that our capital partners helped us, uh, you know, provide a lot of documentation on why we were valuable. So you start, as you go through this process, you start learning about the things that the banks care about and that others have seen that, are, that weaken your valuation. So for example, we've always known that customer concentration is, is something to keep an eye on. They're really diligent about understanding, okay, how much accounts receivable? Is that your biggest customer? What is the percentage of, of overall, right? And we're trying to keep that below 15% based on these conversations. Um, that was the it, that was the point at which their eyebrows would get raised at the bank when your biggest customer equated to more than fifteen one five percent of your exactly revenue? yep Got so it. when you when you start seeing a lot of customer concentration it's just inherent risk uh, so you have to be aware of that we've always been aware of that but it's it's something that you manage for a little bit differently and it's not like you want to fire that customer right or that you want to turn down additional work it just means you need to apply a little bit more effort to to finding new customers and building up around it. Got it. Got it. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm understanding the, the, the rough math here, um, 
total valuation of the company was 23 million, which is a little almost seven times EBITDA, somewhere in a half, six, six and a half to seven times EBITDA. You guys got four and a half up front. You put that in your jeans. They can't touch that. That's that's your money. Yeah, you th- think think more like four went to the two founders and uh, half went to closing costs involved with the EBITDA. So the interesting okay. thing is you pay for a lot of lawyers, your own lawyers, the bank's lawyers for some reason, uh, <laughs> the, the lawyers for the trustee, you a valuation firm, a trustee itself, uh, the capital firm that helped us. So there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of people involved in the event. It can get expensive quick, which is one of the drawbacks of, of ESOPs. Like it's something to be aware of. It, it will be expensive even if you're a smaller business. Yeah, all the administrative and frictional costs, et cetera. Okay. And then so the 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 balance, the 80% you agreed to finance. Do you get an interest rate on that financing? Yeah, so we we have good interest rates on that. Um, we're basically compensated with both interest and with interest rate replacement warrants. So the, oh wow, what is that? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the interest is easy to talk about first. That's paid quarterly, and and the business just pays interest to us. Basically, as we pay off one bank loan, we'll go and re up another bank loan. That will be paid towards the principal of the the seller's notes, and then we okay. just kind of repeat. That what rate is that at, Todd? Again. Four percent. Okay, so you're doing a lot better than you'd get just putting your money in the bank and getting exactly. you know, half a percent or whatever. Got yep. it. Okay. The so you're interest getting... rate replacement warrants are different there. You can think of these almost like um, kind of like stock options or phantom stock. So basically, they are payable uh, replacements for an interest rate, assuming the business is growing and doing well and becoming more valuable. So basically, we get a certain amount of um, shares of the company are like stock options for the two co-founders. At the point when um, those notes are paid off, then we kind of look back and say, okay, here's the value of the company now compared to the value of the company when we closed. Uh, the difference in those are exercisable options for us. And those can be, be sizable. That, I think they were projecting that at about 8% actually of the notes. So those are, are a sizable thing that doesn't drastically impact the, the business's cash flow in the current day but rewards the owners for, for pretty generous loans uh, at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. I'll have to Google that later. You're going way beyond my pay grade here in, <laughs> in terms of explaining stuff. Uh, okay. Believe me, things I've learned in the last year, it's uh, too numerous to list in this. Is, is that right? Yeah. So the, okay. So the 80%, I, I get it. So you're, you're getting an interest rate and these uh, interest rate replacement warrants, which is great. What, how, many years is the company going to take to pay you off, pay, pay you back effectively? Yeah, these are questions that we just closed in April 30th of, the, of this year. So uh, you wake up on May 1st and you're like, hey, great, we just sold the business. And it's like, okay, I have a business now that I'm still running that is saddled with debt in the middle of a <laughs> pandemic and a recession. It's like, what are we doing here? Perfect. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so it was a uh, a healthy refocusing of uh, efforts. Um, We've already paid off, you know, over half of the the loan to the bank. Uh, Again, we're at a company our size, we project we'll probably do about 14 and a half million in revenue this year. Um, You know, looking at somewhere around 25%, that's about 3.75 million uh, in profit. So uh, we're seeing, we are growing too as a company. So we're targeting 16 million or more, 16 and a half million next year. Um, we think this thing can can get up to 150 people, which would be about three times our size hmm. uh, without a lot of changes. So in that case, we would probably pay this thing off in about six, maybe eight years at most. Even if we just stayed flat, you know, we're talking probably eight, nine years, 10 years at most uh, to, to get out from all of the debt. And what I'm hearing you say is there's no fixed timeline. It's a bit fluid based on how... Yeah, there must be some minimum amount that the company pays for the bank. You, yes. Or, so the the bank, the bank loan. Okay. The bank had exactly the bank. I think that first note was like amortized over five years. Okay. Uh, but we're there's also clauses in there that we have to pay uh, excess cash basically to pay that down. But we're well ahead of all of that. Then when you get to the seller's notes, the, the good thing about seller's notes is you can be extremely flexible with repayment on this stuff. So if the company had really fallen on hard times and cash flow was a problem this year, we could forgive the interest payments for the seller's notes or at least defer them to a later date. And that would um, 
basically give the business the, the flexibility and time it needs to pay this stuff back. But the seller's notes, there's, there's not like a, a hard date that they have to be paid back on. Um, it's more of just the clause that now as you pay off the bank loans, it's in the business's best interest to renegotiate for lower rates. So we'll, we'll repeat that process as these are paid off, go out to banks again and see if we can get, you know, uh, another four or $5 million loan, pay down the seller's notes. And we'll probably repeat that process four times or so. Got it. And, and so it's, I find this really interesting with regards to the, um, I lost my train of thought. I, I'm, I've got so many questions going through my head right now. So there is a, in the case of an ESOP, I understand there is a, a kind of a third party, it's like an administrator or what do they call, what, what is that? Like a chairperson or what? That's what exactly is that? what they call them as third party administrators. Administrator. Uh, so, okay. Yep. Okay. So is it their decision uh, whether or not to pay off the seller notes? Is it, do they have to say, well, yeah, we've got the cash to do that. And we want to accelerate, decelerate, like, are you at sort of arm's length from that decision to pay off the seller's note or what? A little bit, yeah. So basically that was one of the, um, one of the clauses involved with negotiating the um, establishment of the ESOP. So it was basically the company will, as these loans are paid off, go out and get more loans to pay off seller's notes uh, and use that because it's in the best interest of the company. Uh, so I think that clause is, is basically meant to cover that. Got it. And did you consider how the ESOP structure would affect the sale of the company the next time around? So in, if you guys grow to 150 employees and whatever it is, 20, 50, $30 million in revenue, and the decision is, is taken to sell the company, that the employees would all similarly benefit from that sale. Did you guys think about what, if any, implications being an ESOP would have on the liquidity or sellability of the company? We did, because then it's not just a decision that Justin and I make. At that point, uh, any, uh, basically any like M&A type uh, event, uh, then the trustee wants to represent the interests of the employees. So the employees would have a voice in, okay, is this a good deal or not? Um, so that that's something that we we at least wanted to keep that option open and the ESOP doesn't preclude that, which is good. Um, I think we felt comfortable that in either case, if we were pitching our employees uh, via sale through the ESOP that, hey, this is a good idea, or if we were trying to pitch our employees uh, outside of the ESOP, you still have to convince people it's, it's the right thing to do and it's in their best interest, et cetera. I think it's a lot easier, honestly, uh, with an ESOP because they're going to stand to have a financial reward at the end of the day. I want to ask a personal question. You can tell me to go to hell if, if it's too personal, but I notice a <laughs> sure. wedding ring. Yeah. And, and I think I see pictures of kids in the background, but in, in any event, I'd love to go to the pillow talk with your spouse when it came to this decision, because on some level, this decision affected your whole family, not just you personally, right? Because you had offers to sell to a private equity group for you know cash, and then it, all the money's there in the bank, and 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 away you go. And in this case, you certainly got rewarded, but it's going to presumably take time, and there is more risk associated with with that. You've 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 loaned the money; you're second to the bank. What's your wife think? <laughs> I guess is yeah. what I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, I. I... One, I think my wife uh, worked for a number of years. Uh, she was probably more well-equipped to run this business than I was. Um, so she's been an awesome sounding board throughout the years for any decision, uh, let alone this one. Um, I think it was, it was great to talk through it with her uh, and just understand what this meant, not just for us, you know, personally and financially, but also for the business. And, uh, you know, I think she's seen the challenges of, being a 50% owner and founder and CEO of a business, it's a lot of stress and time um, and energy that you have to put forth. I don't know that that's shrunk a lot <laughs> since the <laughs> ESOP is closed, but I think we see a path now that aligns with our own personal goals. To uh, One of the benefits of the ESOP is that you separate sale of the company from involvement with the company, right? Justin and I are both still involved in the company. He's CTO, I'm CEO. 
we're still day in, day out working to make Testable uh, uh, an even better software consultancy. Um, but now we don't have to align our end date with the company with some type of, of transaction, right? Like that's already taken place. So we can focus on building a resilient company. And when it feels like we have a better leadership team in place to run this thing than us, then it may be time to move on. What were your employees' reactions when, first of all, before you announced the ESOP, were you getting pressure? You mentioned that you and Justin were like, you know what, we're kind of getting too well rewarded for running this company. At some point, we got to pull up and say, like, we've we've been rewarded for the risk we take. Like, we got to start sharing some of this stuff. Were you getting pressure from employees saying, hey, guys, come on, I'm, I just won that big deal. You know, give me a fair cut at this. Uh, you know, I'm leaving to go to Google because I'm not getting paid. You know, like, were you getting pressure from people to start sharing some of the, the spoils? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I don't know that we saw a ton of direct pressure, but as you mentioned, like competition for software engineers is extremely tough right now. So you have a lot of just, you know, big offers from other companies. And a lot of times those will come with RSUs or, or something else. So what is an RSU, a restricted stock option? Restricted, option? exactly. So like restrict, um, so that stock would be- Stock unit, I guess. Exactly. That would be, you know, maybe a longer term thing that we didn't really feel like we had. So we've always been open books with our people. So we, I publish our uh, consolidated version of our income statement every month to all the employees so that they can see what's going on in the business. Um, we also always had like a some means of aligning their interests with the profitability of the company. And that was typically a bonus pool where basically 10% of the company profits twice a year were distributed among the uh, employees who worked here. So we felt like those pieces were important but the numbers were getting big enough where I think people were starting to look at it and be like, Hey, we made 3 million last year and I got a $12,000 bonus check. Like <laughs> where does the rest of this go? And it's like, well, um, so yeah, I think that it's a fair piece. I don't know that we had a ton of like direct pushback, but we definitely felt competition for people's services. Now I think that what people see is again, they're a little bit, I think probably just skeptical because there are so many bad deals out there with regards to equity, uh, especially with like startups. Um, they've all probably been burnt in one way, shape or form in the past. So they're, they're treating this very skeptical. One thing we did was we did a cash contribution in 2019 to try and jumpstart this, to try and accelerate this. So people, you know, as soon as the program was launched, had a pretty sizable balance, almost 25% of their um, annual compensation hmm. in the plan already as cash, um, ready to move forward. Now, the, the challenge is they'll get some shares this coming year, but the valuation of the company will be depressed while it has as much debt as it does. So it won't be why, the same why, value. Why would that be the case? So we were, <laughs> before as a services company, we were highly profitable making you know 3 million a year. Now as a services company, we're highly profitable, but we have $20 million of debt at this point. Right? Sure, but your multiple was based on EBITDA earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. <laughs> it, it's also based on the fact that we had zero debt, right? So like people okay. always take that into account as well. Um, okay. So the whole picture is gonna show that. Um, and the whole picture shows now, hey, company is still highly valuable. It's still growing. It's still very marketable. It's just got a different balance sheet than what it did before this transaction. So the shares will be depressed for the first few years, but then it'll take off like a rocket as we grow and as we pay down that debt. So it's probably a little bit of a leap of faith for the next two or three years for people to see what this can actually mean for themselves. But they didn't come here for an ESOP anyways. I think the people came here because of the, the things I mentioned earlier, the autonomy, the ability to grow, the variety of life that consulting brings. Um, so we're telling them that, you know, come for those things, stay for the retirement on steroids, which is kind of what these stops are. Got it. And and so going back to this idea of publishing your consolidated financial statements, um, what went into the decision to do that even prior to the ESOP? Yeah, I, probably my own personal scars. I, I think in many ways, Testable is a, a reflection of the 
the scars that Justin and I had at other companies uh, that we had worked with. Uh, one of the companies I had worked at, I think in my first week or two, I was in a leadership position. So we were talking about the financials uh, within that group. And, you know, it didn't come up in the interview process, but we start hearing about one of the founders moving money out of their 401k so that we can make payroll. And I'm like, whoa, what are we doing here? What is happening? And you see that manifest itself in a bunch of short-term decisions, right? A client that you know you're probably not going to delight that you have to take on just so that you can get money coming in the door so that you can make payroll. All these little ways that you can, you know, uh, make decisions in the short-term interest of the business, but that have like negative long-term effects I saw those firsthand. So I was trying to shine a light on it with everybody else in the company. Like, hey, I want you to make decisions in the best interests of the company uh, in the long term. For you to be able to do that, you have to understand where we're at financially. It's a huge piece of the puzzle. Uh, so that's that's what we've been trying to do. Um, and it's interesting as we've grown, we've hired people who used to be CPAs and things like that. And they come in and they start talking about accrual with some of our other employees. <laughs> you see you see the level of like financial competency kind of grow within the business. So now when we're doing budgeting and strategic planning, having 20 people involved is a good thing because they're all thinking about those things. So when you started sharing the profitability, it was more, it sounds like, in an effort to uh, communicate how solid the business was and how profitable and how well run it is. Um, is that, am I putting words in your mouth or was, was that part of the motivation? That's definitely, that's definitely a big part of it. So we wanted to, people to know one, hey, this is what the business is doing. Uh, we even told people, hey, this is what we're keeping as far as like a runway in cash and accounts receivable on hand so that you don't have any reason to worry. Like we're a small mm -hmm. business, uh, but we have you covered. Like you're going to have plenty of time to find something else should things start going sideways. Um, so that was what we were trying to communicate, but I think we also wanted people to, to be able to speak up. If we're seeing profits go above that 25%, I want people to know, uh, Hey, this is the situation that we're in. What do we do with this stuff now? I want to have that discussion with people now too. What is the balance of paying down debt faster versus increasing salaries at that level? Um, I think that should be a, a group discussion as an employee owned company. <laughs> Yeah. And it sounds like there are also some downsides because publishing your profitability when it's a few hundred thousand dollars makes people feel good. And when it's a few million dollars, they start to look around and say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> that could definitely be the case. I mean, we've, especially with this year, we've had some, some challenges just because we took a conservative approach when COVID was running rampant. And in April, we had 25% of our workforce didn't have a client. So we're starting to see, okay, profitability was negative and, and trending to stay that way, which would have meant, hey, we need to make some tough decisions here. So we froze salary adjustments for the year. We said, hey, we're not doing the profit sharing bonus anymore. And people are still, I think, a little bit upset by that because uh, they look in arrears and see like, hey, we're, we're profitable this year. Um, why did we do those things? But you have to try to at least explain, hey, we didn't know what was coming. We didn't know how quickly this stuff would bounce back. And really from April through July, it wasn't, wasn't great months of the company's history from a cash perspective. So uh, I think it's, it's all about trying to get people a higher level of understanding of not just what's in their best interest, what's also in our company's best interest and what's in our client's best interest. And balancing those three um, is, is where I want to get all of us to, to really be comfortable. I had that. Uh, are you, have you ever seen Jack Stack stuff? Have you seen any yeah. of stake in the outcome and yep. great books co-written by Bo Burlingham? Um, you know, I had an opportunity to see him speak, this goes back years ago, and I remember him talking about uh, the importance of educating your staff about things, financial reporting, and how it's oftentimes one of the, the secrets to making an ESOP work, and, and also one of the downsides of, of not uh, being successful, either with open book management in general or an ESOP specifically, is 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 you know you take a you know twenty three year old software engineer who knows nothing about running a business and you're you're all of a sudden throwing out these numbers to them and they can kind of pick and choose things they hear and 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 it, and it's like it's like giving the keys to a sixteen year old to a Ferrari it's it's like a little too much so we, what have you learned about 
training employees on these on the numbers and and what mistakes have you made? What what coaching would you give other entrepreneurs considering this stuff? Yeah, I think uh, first and foremost, don't assume that what you've learned uh, is widely understood. I, I think, if anything, if I could go back, I would spend a lot more time articulating the why, the how, what this means for people, doing it in ways that they appreciate and understand. Because Specifically, the, what though would you communicate on the why and the how? Like specifically, what do you think you might like to have a mulligan on? The really what the ESOP structure is and what it means for people and what it meant for the business and what it meant for Justin, myself, and what it means for the employees. Um, and, and just kind of really articulating what that is and then separating that specifically from like other decisions that we were making around the same time caused by the pandemic and the recession. Um, so I think that it's a complex transaction. There's inside loans. There's the, that's the loan from like the company to the ESOP. There's the seller loans. There's bank loans. People hear all this stuff and are like confused about what's happening. You know, we've had people say, that seems like Todd and Justin are putting the business in harm's way by all the interest and stuff on these loans. And it's like, that's not the case, right? Like one of the other benefits I haven't even talked about with ESOP is that the company has an S Corp that's 100% owned ESOP now. We have no federal income tax liability. And in most states, we have no income tax liability. Wow. So assuming that that's at like 20 to 23%, that's a sizable chunk from 3 million to 4 million. Uh, so that more than offsets like any interest payments that we're making as a result of this ESOP. But again, those are things I'm taking for granted that I didn't communicate to the people. So they're they're left to like kind of come up with these negative fantasies when, if anything, like the business hasn't changed, still profitable, still doing well, your work's still appreciated. Only thing that's changed is you're going to own a piece of it every year. Uh, you're going to own a little bit more and, and you'll see the benefits of it. And, and do you think you've made that case successfully or are there still holdouts? I think by and large, I think, again, with our industry, there's a lot of deep scars from people who've, I shouldn't say feel taken advantage of, from people have who been, have yeah. been taken advantage of. Um, and those, are, those are real experiences and I can't you know, change the fact that that's the lens that they're going to see the world through. All I can do is you know, try to articulate what's going on here um, empathize with their viewpoint and, you know, hopefully they, again, stay for the reasons that make Tesla a great company um, and, and, you know, start to see the benefits of this program a few years out. In your lowest moments, do you ever feel a little bit resentful? Like you're like, don't you know, I could have sold this damn thing for <laughs> millions and be on a beach in Maui and not dealing with all of you people and all your pain. <laughs> like, don't you understand? Do you ever feel like that, that, like that, that sense of resentment boiling up around you? I, I don't know. If res I've literally said portions of what you just articulated. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know that it's resentment as much as just, uh, maybe a little bit of frustration that people feel like we're trying to pull one over on them or people feel like we're prioritizing our own benefits above theirs or above the business. Because really with ESOPs, there are so many structures in place to make sure they can't be abused uh, by ownership. Uh, so ESOPs are, in my opinion, the one way that you get uh, really fair and equitable um, ownership among a broader base of employees. And, and the reality is people didn't really need to do anything to receive it, right? They're, they're still continuing to work uh, for the compensation package that they agreed to when they came in here. So I don't know that resents the right word, but it's definitely frustrating to, to try and do something that you feel like is really in people's best interest that you didn't necessarily need to do uh, and get pushback that, hey, uh, what, what's in it for me? And it's like, well, the company's in it for you. It's right here. It's being given to you. Would you do it again if you had to do, to do all the Definitely. Original? Definitely. One of the reasons I love uh, getting on a uh, podcast like this, talking about it and talking about it with other you know, magazine articles and things like that is that I think more and more businesses need to understand this is a huge win for you as an owner. It's a huge win for your business. And it's a huge win for your employees. And Jack Stack was onto something like this is how you, you know, apply the great game of business. Uh, this is one way that you can do it so that people start to see, hey, my, my actions at this client are directly affecting our bottom line, and I'm going to be the recipient of that uh, in some way, shape, or form. 
So I think it's it's a really great tool for alignment uh, with employees and with the business. And I I honestly don't see a lot of drawbacks. Like it doesn't work for all businesses because there are some cash flow considerations. There's a certain size of business that you need to be, I think, for you to pull this off. Uh, but man, if if people are able to to take a hard look at ESOP as a strategy, um, I think they should do it. Again, I, I've heard numbers in, in and around sort of 30 employees would be sort of roughly a minimum cutoff. Would you, would you, in terms of to under, you know, the, the administrative burden and expenses of that, you need to have a certain size? I think that uh, some, some had said 20 or more employees. I think when we were first okay. talking to people, um, cash flow of uh, one and a half million or so. Um, because and, you got to pay you down know, the debt and, and there's a lot of, Exactly. You're going to have some money to, yeah. And I think that it's just going to be hard to finance the actual transaction costs if you're not making enough cash. So I think you, you want to be able to, to pay that stuff off. Uh, it doesn't have to be extremely quick, but you definitely can't wreck your finances of your business. Otherwise, people are just owning shares of something that's not worth anything. Got it. Got it. Well, I, I'm just so grateful for you to educate me on this topic. I know uh, it's uh, it's one that I've been curious about for a long time. And so I'm really excited to uh, to have had the opportunity to speak with you about it. Um, if people wanted to reach out uh, and, and sort of connect with you, I don't know if you could point them anywhere to do that, uh, a website, you should, uh, let's, uh, let's make sure we, we let people know about Test Double if they want. Great custom software developed, <laughs> where can they find out about Test Double? Yeah, definitely. So our website is uh, www.testdouble.com. Uh, you can definitely uh, find out more about our business there. I love talking about this stuff. Um, again, I'm still at the novice level of ESOP understanding. So I've learned a lot. If I've Wait a minute, what does that on, make me? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but if I've misspoken on anything, uh, you know, hopefully somebody can correct me and we can, you know, add that to the show notes or something. But um, yeah, I love talking about this. I love, uh, you know, just kind of uh, hearing from other founders, some of the challenges and, and their paths for uh, pursuing exit strategies and, and more broad ownership uh, specifically. So if people want to talk to me about it directly, they can reach me at my email, which is Todd, T-O-D-D at testumble.com. Awesome. There you go. Right to the horse's mouth. Todd, it was great to meet you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it was great to meet you as well. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.